This week, we mark the 37th anniversary of the 1987 Constitution. That means that the present Constitution has been in effect for about as long as the 1935 Constitution. It is already the Constitution that has survived the longest without any amendment or revision. In a few months, it will be definitely the longest to have endured. And yet the challenges to the 1987 Constitution and the legal order it created are today at their sharpest. There is a possibility that charter change will finally take place. Which protections that we gain under the 1987 Constitution may be under threat from charter change? Good evening, I'm John Neri and you are in the public square. Tonight, to discuss this issue, we are joined by a distinguished panel of lawyers. Attorney Oliver Xavier Reyes, who is uh, uh, zooming in from the UP College of Law, where he teaches. Attorney Lulu G. Reyes, no relation, of the St. Louis University School of Law in Baguio City. And here in the studio by Attorney Christina Conti of the National Union of Lawyers of the Philippines. Good evening, Attorney Oli, Attorney Lulu, Attorney Chrissy. Thank you for joining us in the public square. Good evening, John. Thank you. Good, Good evening. evening from Baguio. You know, I tried to invite lawyers who studied for the bar under either the 1935 or the 1973 constitutions, but unfortunately, none of them could make it tonight. May I start by asking if each of you, who all took the bar under the 1987 constitution, what do you know of the difference between the way law was understood and practiced before EDSA and after EDSA? Maybe I can start with Attorney Lulu, and then Attorney Oli, and then Attorney Chrissy. The closest encounters I had uh, with lawyers who operated or perhaps passed the bar under the 1935 Constitution were my law professors. Mm -hmm. um, and to them, or at least the way that they taught us uh, the Constitution, um, where they were trained was purely from a very American perspective, the 1935 Constitution having been passed and ratified under the American regime, mm -hmm. um, where since legal, our legal system was much simpler, we had very few institutions, but many of these institutions were actually uh, replicas of an American system where they had three uh, co-equal but separate and independent um, branches, such as you had the executive there, headed by the president, mm -hmm. and then the judiciary, mm -hmm. uh, the Supreme Court, and of course, a bicameral uh, Congress. So it's largely an American constitution that they operated uh, within, and that was a kind of um, legal system that we were uh, taught under. Attorney Oli? Yeah. So one of the more most fundamental changes even that uh, 1987 brought about that differs from both 35 and 73 is this concept of expanded uh, judicial review, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to whether or not the courts may review the decisions or interfere, quote unquote, interfere with the decisions of these other branches of government, the executive and the legislative branch. Because in cases that were decided under the 1935 Constitution, and perhaps adhering as well to American jurisprudence, um, there was hesitance on the part of the courts as much as possible to reverse or to overturn the decisions of the executive, the chief executive, or the legislative, uh, even if there was clear error. And I think the culmination of that political question doctrine was the landmark slash notorious case of Avellana versus Executive Secretary mm -hmm. decided in 1973, wherein majority of the justices agreed that yes, the manner by which the 1973 Constitution was not consistent with what was prescribed under the 1935 Constitution, but agenda, what can we do about it? But so, yeah, and it's telling that one of the, the chief justices at the time, Chief Justice Conception, mm -hmm. who was reputedly 
so disgusted by Javeliana that he retired early, he happened to be a member of the 1987 Constitutional Commission. And he made sure by crafting what, what is the definition of judicial power mm -hmm. under Article 8, Section 1, that the political, that the courts should no longer be able to avoid deciding questions involving the other branches just because mm -hmm. they raised a so-called political question by a co-equal yeah. branch. But we'll, we'll have time later. In fact, I, I included in that in my list of questions yeah. to, 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 to go back to discuss this uh, uh, narrowing of the political question scope. No? Um, Attorney Chrissy? Well, the one lawyer that I practiced under mm -hmm. who, uh, who was trained under the 1935 Constitution was Romeo Capulong. Okay. And his work was, if I were to reflect on practicality rather mm -hmm. than on the academic side of things, mm -hmm. his work really was uh, geared um, on or, or focused on national sovereignty. I guess this is a product of that because the 1935 constitution is, well, uh, a constitution that freed us from mm -hmm. the Americans. Mm -hmm. So there was great emphasis on his work on national sovereignty. Mm -hmm. He worked on the U.S. basis issue. He worked eventually on the VFA issue, and then we carried this on with the EDCA issue, mm -hmm. um, cases, uh, um, issues which we took to the Supreme Court. And in practice, um, just to reflect on how I guess lawyers were treated before, mm -hmm. um, they were treated with deference. I mean, mm -hmm. they were thought to be, I don't know how it applies now, they were mm -hmm. thought to be um, some of the, or among the most learned mm -hmm. in the country mm -hmm. to the extent that during that time no, um, the ones who were running for senator were either lawyers right. or trained well. Mm -hmm. It's different now. There's basketball players and artists, etc. Mm -hmm. Romeo Capulong ran for the Senate, I think, mm -hmm. or, or Congress mm -hmm. under the Partido ng Bayan at one point because clearly there was space for lawyers, there was space for thinkers, there mm -hmm. was space for statesmen mm -hmm. in politics as well. So I don't know if what kind of reflection that would be if, I mean, naturally people felt that lawyers moved into the political realm and then I guess there's uh, Marcos himself as an example. But nowadays it feels a little bit different because lawyers are on the margins, mm -hmm. um, in a sense fighting against government. There are a lot of lawyers who are in government, of course, mm -hmm. but it's the ones who are fighting against um, excesses, abuses, who are um, at the forefront, I would say. Uh, one, one, one more pre-EDSA uh, question. I, I understand, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that during the martial law years, uh, under the 1973 Constitution, there was an emphasis on mastery of administrative law because that's, that was where the legal action was allowed to happen. Uh, is there any truth or uh, is, that, is that accurate, that, uh, that uh, reading of uh, legal history? Attorney Ali? Well, I think, it's, I think it's worth noting that under the 1973 Constitution, one of the features was that then-President Marcos could actually legislate or exercise the power to make laws, mm -hmm. even without the participation of Congress. And actually, a lot of the administrative superstructure uh, during during that era was actually primarily defined by presidential decrees or presidential orders. So uh, I guess in the sense that there was an administrative overhaul that took place during that time, uh, a lawyer who was who is able to master uh, administrative bureaucracy would be well placed. But I think it's worth mentioning that, well, uh, Mr. Marcos then could actually do it all on his own. So um, the, without the uh, you know, intervention or feedback from Congress. That was the infamous uh, Amendment Six, no, of the yes. 1973 Constitution. Attorney Lulu. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but you took the bar in 1991. So when you went to law school, this was in the flush of uh, triumph uh, after uh, EDSA people power. Um, did the EDSA experience uh, influence the way uh, you were taught law? Uh, definitely. 
Um, maybe because I live in an area mm -hmm. that is staunchly uh, pro Marcos, mm -hmm. so the way the law was taught to us um, included perceptions of how um, unjust the ouster of the Marcoses was um, oh. and how <laughs> the new government was perceived with distrust rather than any semblance of regularity. Mm -hmm. uh, up to this day, um, that kind of attitude or should I say belief mm -hmm. is perpetuated even among legal circles, at least where I practice, mm -hmm. um, especially for the older generation of lawyers who were, who I believe are sentimental about the kind of order that the 1973 constitution and martial law gave to them. Um, so it's, it's really a different kind of environment mm -hmm. compared perhaps to how law was taught in University of the Philippines or even in Ateneo. Mm -hmm. But of course, we had what we call uh, activist professors mm -hmm. uh, in law school, but they were very few. And it is from those activist professors or who we uh, felt adhered to the new system or to the new order placed under the by the 1987 constitution that we more or less gained the motivation to study uh, history and how our legal system and attitudes and even judicial attitudes change because of the kind of legal environment we were working under. I, I find that fascinating. No? Um, so even in the in the late 1980s, there was already this kind of pushback. No? Uh, I think we must note that Marcos himself was a uh, was a complete uh, lawyer, right? I mean, uh, that was part of his uh, uh, myth. Uh, you know that he was uh, 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 he was in fact a, a, a very good lawyer, um, and maybe that was part of the. Uh, um, the equivalent of the mythical superstructure <laughs> to the to the legal superstructure that he had created. But I maybe just one quick follow up, Attorney Lulu. Uh, where did you sense? The, where did you get this uh, this kind of attitude from the professors and from uh, you know like judges of the court of first instance or regional trial courts? I mean, wh wh where where did where did that come from? Uh, of course. In the classroom, in the law classroom, you'd get that sense um, without being pejorative about it now. Uh, we had professors who were actually Marcos loyalists and who would, um, during lectures, mm -hmm. uh, really um, include in their statements pro-Marcos ideas mm -hmm. or memes as what we would call them now <laughs> uh, like the Bagong Lipunan how the 1973 constitution and martial law for example simplified um, the legal system and how lawyers were better respected during that time mm -hmm. and that because Marcos himself was a lawyer he was the he was the lawdi or, or the aspirational yeah. lawyer mm -hmm. for many of us in the mm -hmm. classroom. At least that's how we were uh, raised inside the law classroom. And that kind of attitude, believe me, uh, Sir John, mm -hmm. is still prevalent now. Remember Cordillera mm -hmm. always votes higher for Marcoses than the rest of the country. In fact, in some instances, um, the Marcos votes in the Cordillera mm -hmm. are higher than the Ilok. Ilocos region. That is interesting. It's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, area for study why Cordillerans are staunchly pro Marcos. And also law as a, a site of resistance. Uh, uh, interesting. Attorney Chrissy, uh, would it be fair to say that when you went to law school, all of this was taken for granted? Yes, definitely. Uh, we, we, I studied under the 1987 Constitution. By the time, it was an old Constitution, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, things were in place already, and there were a lot of jurisprudence under it. But thankfully, well, um, there was this year that the UP College of Law offered a subject, martial law. 
Okay. And uh, I did that elective, and it was enlightening in the sense that you put they put together all the decisions mm -hmm. um, without say without being pro Marcos or anti Marcos. They just put all together the, the decisions and let the students study. Mm -hmm. The decisions have as they were, and going. I'm sorry, back, these are decisions of the of, during the martial law period. Of oh, okay. during the martial law period of okay. the Supreme Court. Okay. So decisions that were promulgated by the Conception Court mm -hmm. and so forth. The Fernando Court. And yes. So, um, so it, it was interesting to see how um, the decisions changed through the years, especially uh, as they changed at the time that martial law was declared. Mm -hmm. And as we've seen, uh, the Hadeliana decision was mm -hmm. very peculiar in the sense that the court just gave up and said, OK, <laughs> there being no, mm -hmm. nothing, no barrier, no, no, no obstacle, then therefore the 1973 Constitution is, is OK. Mm -hmm. and, w w and going back to the first question, what's interesting is that there was a lot of, um, we call it legalese, but you're right, it's more administrative legalese mm -hmm. because the way martial law and Marcos perpetuated mm -hmm. himself into power was by tweaking around the institutions, mm -hmm. by going through the, so we speak, the gray areas. Mm -hmm. So there's no law on this uh, for or against or prohibiting this or saying yes. Mm -hmm. So he exploited that by putting in something that was, that there, where there was no law or there was no regulation. Mm -hmm. And which is precisely why the one of the first cases after martial law, we took this up, but as an aside, mm -hmm. Panyada versus Tuvera mm -hmm. was very important <laughs> because in this decision, um, there was an, an issue about how about all these laws that um, the president promulgated, but mm -hmm. which the people did not see the light of day of the, mm -hmm. these documents. Mm -hmm. And so in Panyada versus Tuvera, it was clearly put there that laws have to be published within 15 days and so forth. Mm -hmm. And this seemed like a minimal, it, it's, it, it's a small case, to, so to speak. No, It's just how to publish, when to publish, where to publish, how many days after will it be effective. But it, it, it does, uh, it, it affects almost every other law after that because this is the publication of laws mm -hmm. and the effectivity of laws. And so people say um, you can't be, it's not saying about the ignorance of the law excuses no one. Mm -hmm. But in this case, you really can invoke that mm -hmm. because I don't know exactly why I'm being punished, mm -hmm. and you cannot hold me to to uh, you ca cannot hold me liable because I did not know that it was uh, law at that time. And these are criminal laws that we are talking about, not just administrative laws or small laws or ordinances like jaywalking. These are criminal laws, um, like some um, similar to sedition, similar to uh, rebellion. And so these were very crucial at the time of a great upheaval and revolution, especially during the height of martial law. Yeah. I'm, I'm also reminded that uh, even in his presidential diaries, um, Marcos wrote down the instances when he, uh, he called it consulta, when he made consulta with sitting uh, Supreme Court justices. I think the most prominent, or the one that I remember the most, is Fred Ruiz Castro. So this was even before martial law was declared. Uh, the first martial law uh, hearings, I think in 1971, uh, he consulted a sitting Supreme Court justice so that he could uh, change his legal strategy to be able to win a majority of the, of, uh, of the court's votes. And I just found it very interesting that uh, he did not think it, you know that he did not think to hide it uh, in his presidential diaries. I don't know what he was planning with his presidential diaries. I don't think there's a complete edition of the diaries as they were found after EDSA. But I thought that was just very interesting. He's, he had a very different approach to <laughs> to his relationship with the with the Supreme Court justices. Now let's talk about the 1987 Constitution. Uh, so again, uh, Attorney Lulu, then Attorney Oli, then Attorney Chrissy, um, which new protection uh, uh, would you like to highlight that, uh, that we gained from the 1987 Constitution, uh, which was perhaps a direct response to the experience under uh, the 1973 Constitution? Attorney Lulu? I always like to think that the 1987 Constitution is a Marcos Constitution because it was crafted and formulated under the long shadows of martial law mm -hmm. and the first Marcos regime. Mm -hmm. So that 
what stands out for me are the additional protections um, written into the 1987 Constitution. First, the expanded human rights or Bill of Rights in Article 3, especially the rights of the accused, um, the specific provision prohibiting uh, um, placing detainees in comunicado mm -hmm. um, or indefinite um, uh, detention. Those are reactions to the experience of martial law. Also, to me, important in the 1987 Constitution is the recognition of the role and, of course, the institutionalization of the Commission of Human Rights, mm -hmm. uh, which we always has always been belittled, especially during the previous, immediately previous administration, mm -hmm. but which actually plays a significant role in many human rights violations, especially in investigation thereof, mm -hmm. even up to this day. Their role might not be as prominent as we want it to be, um, but still the Commission on Human Rights is an important agency independent from uh, all other investigatory agencies, but especially devoted hu to human rights violations. And to me, um, another important innovation in the 1987 Constitution um, is, of course, the Office of the Ombudsman having been um, um, expressly mentioned in the 1987 Constitution because it seeks really to address um, abuses in public office, again, which is a reaction to many of the abuses committed by public officers during the martial law era, uh, where they really disregarded the basic principle of public um, office exactly. is a public trust. Mm -hmm. So those are the important highlights for me. Thank you. Attorney Oli? I tend to be a bit skeptical about this, uh, about the changes that were introduced. Of course, there are some that are very obviously and effectively direct reactions to uh, the martial law rules, such as, for example, the martial law provision itself, which uh, increases the requirements before a president may declare martial law. I mentioned about the judicial review earlier. Uh, there's also the um, there's also the judicial and bar council, which takes out of the hands of the legislative the power to appoint judges. Mm -hmm. But I think that the well, the more well, some of the possible, what could have been the more fundamental changes, well, um, actually did not take effect. Take, for example, the provisions on political dynasties, which could have, if it were implemented fundamentally, altered the way that polit uh, or, well, the nature of our politics right now. But because uh, the commissioners decided that the details should be left up to Congress mm -hmm. to implement, well, Congress has not done so. Um, and then there are a lot of statements in the 1987 Constitution that, um, well, that highlight its progressive nature, that emphasize you know, uh, rights of uh, underrepresented sectors, prior labor, women, etc. But the problem, or the thing about those provisions is that well, these are, have been recognized by the Supreme Court as mere policy statements and not the source of actual rights, not the source of actual obligations. And leaving it again up to Congress to actually pass laws that uh, align with these so-called state policies. So, um, I mean, there has been a lot of talk that the 1987 Constitution is a progressive document, and if you read the text of the Constitution, yes, you will be able to point to provisions that uh, highlight its progressive nature, but as to whether or not these have these actually actualized rights or obligations that are enforceable, well, um, there, those types of provisions are very limited. The only one really that has been uh, given quite effect by the Supreme Court is the one about the right to a healthful ecology, which in the famous case of Oposa versus Factor and said was the source of enforceable rights. But other than that, uh, well, 
many of the provisions of the 1987 Constitution remain a promise rather than a guarantee, or rather than a uh, source of rights. Thank you. Attorney Chrissy? Yeah, there have been a lot of examples already, and mm -hmm. in particular, the martial law mm -hmm. provision mm -hmm. has been really um, fleshed out. Uh, what's crucial there is there's a distinction of powers between the executive, what are the powers of the legislative, what are the powers of the judiciary with the expanded judicial review. Mm -hmm. But there's also this, aside from the other um, provisions that strengthen structural um, uh, roles, uh, I'd like to also notice, uh, note the, uh, the provisions on media. Mm -hmm. So there was a clear laying out that media has to be owned and managed 100% by Filipinos. Mm -hmm. um, there was a mention about monopolies. There was a mention about the role of media in nation building. Mm -hmm. And this is really um, important uh, because during the time of Marcos, the media was one of those worst hit mm -hmm. by his, say, legalese. Um, in, on one hand, he really exerted this power and he really um, hit them financially. I mean, he took over some of the um, media organizations uh, forcibly, in a sense, through uh, taking over the ownership. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, um, things carried on. And he did not literally padlock these institutions, save for a few. Uh, for example, the, in the Burgos versus uh, DOJ secretary case, mm -hmm. the We Forum, etc. Uh, he, he took over these institutions insidiously. Mm -hmm. And so I think in the 1987 constitution, there was an attempt mm -hmm. to make sure that the media will be as free as possible. You know, that really strikes me because I, I'm, I'm trying to make a list of uh, everything that you've said. And my next question for all three of you is, um, will these new protections uh, be changed under any uh, attempt to change the Constitution? Will they be part of the, the provisions that will be uh, revised uh, or, or amended? No? But, but I was just really struck by your mention of, of the media. Um, for instance, the um, greater uh, uh, rights protections, um, is that at risk if, for instance, a constitutional convention were to be convened? Um, how about the uh, terms uh, on uh, the martial powers of the commander-in-chief? Uh, would that be re-expanded? Is it possible to re-expand them? under a constitutional convention or a constituent assembly, uh, or the protections given to the media, uh, for instance, 100% ownership, will that uh, be at risk in charter change? Maybe at the same order, Attorney Lulu, Attorney Oli, and then Attorney Chrissy. Um, my current sentiment about the moves to amend the 1987 constitution is not focus on the manner uh, by which such amendments or even revisions take uh, place. But my concern largely is in how uh, a plebiscite would go about mm -hmm. or would take place. Uh, because the antecedent events to before a plebiscite would more or less place all of us in the same kind of uh, dilemma as to how what what extent would for perhaps a constitutional convention touch or um, play with the 1987 constitution? Would it be simple individual amendments? Because a constitutional convention can in fact overhaul uh, the uh, entire instrument. If we learned our lesson in the 1971 constitutional commission, uh, after two years of serious mm -hmm. efforts, it bo all boiled down to a 1973 Marcos Constitution mm -hmm. um, overtaken by the Declaration of Martial Law in 1972 mm -hmm. with plebiscite being conducted through so-called barangay assemblies. Mm -hmm. um, a con the current Congress convening itself in into a constituent assembly is equally dangerous because you have a supermajority there 
uh, controlled by um, parties that adhere or are very close to the current administration um, and whose intents are not so clear, although their pronouncements are, but the intents are not. Um, in a people's initiative, it might be more difficult as a process, but who's to say what kind of initiatives may be presented to the COMELEC and um, pres um, approved during a plebiscite. So my concern really here is not really the manner by which such revisions or amendments take place, mm -hmm. but what kind of mindset we have, will we have in the uh, plebiscite process? Uh, because it's largely a political exercise and really the dominant um, mindset here is that whatever the current administration proposes usually uh, gets passed mm -hmm. because that's where we are as a, as a nation. Um, there's hardly any opportunity for debate or even dissent. There is, there are pockets for resistance and even perhaps elaboration or contestation, but usually when you present, when we, I think when we present something to the electorate on constitutional amendment, we, many of, many of our, uh, of us, many voters would just perhaps parrot what has been sold to them um, by popular media. That's my fear. Thank you. Attorney Oli? Well, I, I do agree with the Bernie Lulu that, well, uh, whether it's peaceful amendments or uh, entire overhaul or revision of the 1987 constitution that's going to be very material in well, essentially deciding the future of our constitution i mean uh, if it's going, just going to be peace if it's going to be peaceful amendments which appears to be the thrust of the attempt to do it by people's initiative, since you can only introduce amendments rather than a revision to people's initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're just going to see, well, uh, at least initially, attempts to tweak provisions such as, for example, the so-called economic provisions. Now, uh, and those perhaps would not be existential questions on the part of the Philippines, because, you know, um, in fact, I tend to be agnostic about uh, the economic provisions and uh, somewhat deferential to the ability of Congress to, well, legislate as necessity needs. But of course, overhaul, where change, for example, the structure of government, um, that would be, as I said, more existential. And unfortunately, the way that the process has normally turned out, it's still you know, it's really dependent on pro political power, who is in control, um, the parties who are in control. If they decide to have an elected constitutional convention, mm -hmm. probably the membership of the elected CONCOM will also reflect the current yeah. political majorities. And I mean, it would, have, it would be ideal if, for example, the questions that are put forward in a plebiscite are you know, even more elemental, not simply as was done in 1987, by the way, do you agree with this entire 100-page uh, text, yes or no? But maybe if the plebiscite were to ask more directed questions, such as, for example, do you want a parliamentary form of government? Do you want term limits? I mean, you know, I think that those questions would be able to place the voters, to better focus the voters yeah. on what exactly the direction of our country should be. But I doubt that it will play out that way. Attorney Crazy? On the substance of the mm -hmm. charter change pr proposals, there's been a lot. Uh, but I'd like to focus on the economic mm -hmm. um, aspect. So um, there are different types of wordings for the and different types of proposals as regards economics. But it, it's all geared towards opening up of the economy. So both for ownership of um, land ownership of um, the, the the corporations that engage in this kind of practice for example in the 100 percent ownership and managed uh, media organizations it could be expanded mm -hmm. yeah so um i'm very concerned about that because them the foreigners coming in and taking over 
um, obviously, um, they have a lot more dollar power, mm -hmm. um, economic power, and they can very well take over our um, operations. And mm -hmm. there is a value or there is a spirit behind Filipino first. Mm -hmm. Or we think Filipino, and it's a Filipino who can um, think best for the Filipino mm -hmm. uh, as a minimum. I know there are a lot of Filipinos who won't be thinking in the interest of the Filipinos, but mm -hmm. still, it's a, it's a minimum. Mm -hmm. And I'm concerned about the way the provisions or the proposals are being um, crafted. It's very minimal and very uh, not that intrusive. Actually, I, I would imagine for the, it, it's not for media yet. Uh, mm -hmm. So far, I haven't heard any proposal for the media uh, requirement. But for ownership of land, it would say, for example, 100%, um, uh, no foreigner, actually, it doesn't say no foreigners, but Filipinos can own uh, land, can own property, etc. And then they will insert a provision saying that until or unless Congress, why, Congress otherwise yes. provides. Mm -hmm. And so that's very critical because for me as a voter, as a, a part of the plebiscite, I would say, okay, they did not take out the provision. They just added the provision. But then that's where the danger lies because if I approve that, later on the power to approve that kind of amendment and say, okay, Congress eventually will say, okay, it's no longer 100%. It's now 80%. Um, in, the, in, in case of advertising, it's 70%. Mm -hmm. Right now, okay, for advertising, say 50%. We're low, we will lower down the Filipino uh, requirement to, to 50%. Congress will be the one providing for that, not me. Um, in the current constitution, I can decide if I want to lower these percentages. But in the future, if mm -hmm. I... Uh, I, I mistakenly approve this kind of provision until or unless Congress otherwise provides, which seems innocuous, then I've left it up to the congressman to decide my fate. But, you know, um, it takes a lot of effort and money <laughs> to change the Constitution. So I think uh, there, there's no gain saying that there's, re uh, there's a real attempt to to uh, at least seed the ground for a change of the Constitution. But I want to ask... Even if you wanted, uh, well, let me put it this way, is there a real need to change the constitution even if you wanted more power? Look at Duterte. Uh, despite the restrictions on you know, the commander-in-chief powers, uh, declaration of martial law and so on and so forth, he practically ran the country the way he wanted uh, to run. Uh, look at the restrictions on media, the protections for media rather. But Look at what happened to ABS-CBN. They are uh, so thoroughly defeated, they don't even want to file another application for a legislative franchise. Um, so it is, in fact, possible uh, to wo work around all the post-Marcos or anti-Marcos provisions and uh, come up with an illiberal uh, regime. Why even bother to change the Constitution? Well, John, yeah, you're not. <laughs> okay, uh, Oli. You, you need to change. Yeah, you need to change the constitution if you want to lift term limits. I mean, term limits would be uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, just a point about the economic provisions because it's interesting that uh, at least right now, uh, the main public justification for engaging in constitutional amendments is in order to liberalize these nationality restrictions that had been hard uh, hard coded into the 1987 constitution that's right but just last year or rather two years ago uh, there was a very significant law amendment to the public service act which actually effectively liberalized a lot of the sectors that uh, there have been frequent complaints about that it was too close uh, so telcos for example um, so some mass transportation by and Congress was able to do this by limiting the definition of so-called public utilities because public utilities under the Constitution uh, they are subjected to these nationality requirements mm -hmm. but what Congress did was that they just redefined the public utilities in order to limit it to just five power electricity water uh, public utility transportation and so, um, industries such as telcos, for example, they've been 
um, able to now have greater foreign ownership. Mm -hmm. And since that has already happened, and the justification now is oh, we need to amend the constitution in order to allow for greater foreign investment, I think that there should be a very serious, very serious public debate as to oh, if that is your intention, oh, well, we already had amended public service act. Mm -hmm. Why else would you need to amend the constitution on economic grounds? So I hope that the, if they do indeed pursue if the debate is going to focus on the need to just change the economic provisions alone, nothing else, mm -hmm. I hope that the debate would center about you know uh, these other developments wherein well, liberalization in order to attract more foreign investment has already occurred yeah. quite dramatically. Uh, unless, of course, the attempt to change the economic provisions is the Trojan horse for <laughs> term limits or something else. Attorney Lulu... Uh, you want no, to I wanted to. I wanted to do a quick reply to your uh, mm -hmm. statement that Duterte ran the government um, and basically uh, disregarded the 1987 Constitution um, the way he wanted it. Actually, can you imagine a Duterte administration without the 1987 Constitution restrictions or limitations? Mm. He would have done <laughs> more <laughs> than he already did with his drug war campaign. Okay. Uh, nevertheless, I also think that the current move to amend the 1987 Constitution, uh, at least for the economic provisions, are unnecessary because many of the existing um, limitations in the 1987 Constitution provide an avenue for Congress to pass legislation, for example, if you if we read carefully the prohibition or uh, against aliens or non-Filipino citizens owning lands in the Philippines, it's not actually how that's not actually how the 1987 Constitution uh, imposes the ban because it merely says that persons who are not qualified to own public lands cannot own private lands in the Philippines. So if one way of interpreting this is, of course, to amend the Public Land Act and to allow foreigners to actually own or uh, apply for public lands in the Philippines without having to touch the 1987 Constitution. So there are many indirect ways, indirect uh, in the sense that you don't have to tinker with the Constitution that, um, itself, but Congress uh, can simply exercise its powers by uh, looking for those uh, stipulations in the 1987 Constitution, which says unless otherwise provided by law. So there are already that. If there is an amendment to the 1987 Constitution that I like to see mm -hmm. is a constitutional definition of a political dynasty. Mm -hmm. That's the one I'm really excited about. Uh, quick, quick, uh, uh, quick, quick follow up. Do you need the Constitution to define it? Isn't there yes. a definition in the Sangunian... No? I don't think so. I think the 1986 Con Con were too trusting of Congress <laughs> after them mm -hmm. or under the 1987 Constitution that they left too much, or at yeah. least we as a people left too much mm -hmm. to Congress to decide upon. And okay. look where we are now. All right. Attorney Chrissy, uh, do you think that this uh, current campaign to change the Constitution has in its sights the enhanced civil liberties or rights protections? Oh, is, is that an issue? Huh? <laughs> definitely not. Um, I think this, uh, as with several other um, efforts, mm -hmm. um, these are targeted towards political gain of individuals. Okay. Um, as to the economic provisions, I agree. Um, these are unnecessary. Why are, why are these companies, there's foreign companies, not coming into the Philippines? Mm -hmm. It's because power rates are high. And there's corruption, there's mm -hmm. SOP, so there's a lot of overhead, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, for them. And they're just unwilling to, to take the chances in the Philippines, which is mm, comparatively within the region, um, there are other choices. So, it's, so if it's not the, the primary uh, driver, then what is? And I think that would be the political gains for these um, politicians. I agree it's the Trojan horse mm -hmm. um, that's coming into the Philippines now, but uh, to us, uh, foisted upon us, the electorate. But I guess 
we're not yet at that night of revelry and with the, uh, the soldiers coming out of the horse yet. Mm -hmm. But um, if we're not careful, this could really blow up in our faces. Now, I, I, I'd just like to also mention about um, political dynamics. I think there was this proposal that I saw somewhere mm -hmm. that the proposal was um, to, to limit it to the third degree of mm -hmm. consanguinity. So I think the first cousin, mm -hmm. uh, that would be qualified, a third or, se or fourth, I think. So um, curious enough, there are a lot of ways to go around the Constitution. I agree there mm -hmm. are even the, I mean, for as an example, the CARP, the Comprehensive Agrarian Reform, mm -hmm. well, it was a law, but um, the distribution of land is an integral part of the 1987 Constitution and the, the Aquino administration. But until now, it's what, 25 years, 30 years almost of CARP, and there's n nothing to be said. Um, even the concept of, of justice, for victims of human rights violations, which was put in the 1987 Constitution, a recognition that um, these are the rights violations and these are the people who would uh, stand to be, uh, uh, whose rights stand to be violated. Until now, there have been no transitional justice mechanism, mechanisms. After the uh, Marcos administration, after the Mar martial law, and I think that's one of the problems. Um, it's all about the people. Uh, the 1987 Constitution uh, what, ha, wanted to be, uh, before that we had the, the Freedom Constitution, I think, the Revolutionary yeah. Constitution. Mm -hmm. So what we wanted to separate ourselves from the previous administration. But unfortunately, you had the same people mm -hmm. in, in government. I mean, Enrile, who was one of the architects of martial law, main implementers. Was, he was yeah. the one who did the, was, the, the drama first, right? The to to yeah. implement martial law. Mm -hmm. Uh, turned out to be Senate president under mm -hmm. the 1987 Constitution for so long. Mm -hmm. And he even has a, a decision now under it that upheld his right to bail mm -hmm. and to temporary freedom. Uh, on, on a ground that he did not raise? <laughs> yes, so this is uh, farcical to some extent because mm -hmm. the same people who, who implemented, who created the 1937 Constitution are the same ones who flourished and survived under the 1987. That's, that's a great point. Uh, we're running long, so maybe just uh, uh, one last question for each of you. Uh, a quick question and a quick answer, hopefully. Uh, Attorney Oli, um, how would you characterize the way the Supreme Court over the last three decades has interpreted the 1987 Constitution? Um, well, um, A, firstly, uh, they've been quite hesitant, for example, and I mentioned this earlier, to uh, make operative a lot of the provisions that initiate state policies. Mm -hmm. They've been very hesitant to uh, accord them or, or recognize these as having this being the source of rights and, of, and obligations. So if assuming that the framers of the 87 Constitution intended that as a result we would have a more, you know, uh, Progressive uh, society. Uh, well, um, that that relative conservatism on the part of the Supreme Court has somewhat inhibited that. But at the same time, at least in the last fifteen years, and uh, there has been a significant. Uh, although this is very very legalist, but the standards that the Supreme Court has been utilizing in analyzing especially due process cases has become more sophisticated mm -hmm. and uh, I think that that is a very welcome development and I think that this could possibly lead to a recognition of greater rights under the ambit of the Bill of Rights um, and I don't think that that will even if they do overhaul the Constitution I suspect that they will leave a lot of the Bill of Rights uh, intact uh, the question, of course, is whether or not in actual practice mm -hmm. um, these rights would be respected. And I think that the lesson that we can, we, one lesson that we have learned over the years is that whatever the Constitution is, um, you know, there will always be attempts by those in power to be able to, well, exploit, uh, reinterpret, and, you know, try to perpetuate themselves. Um, whatever the constitution is. That's why sometimes they tend to be skeptical about uh, 
changes about the constitution because it really ultimately depends on the people who are in power. Thank you. Attorney Lulu, not to put you on the spot, but uh, I was really struck by what you said earlier about uh, the mindset uh, in, in your area when you were studying law, uh, the pro-Marcos mindset. I wonder, has this mindset uh, grown to such an extent that even if there's no real need to change the constitution, they would want to change the constitution because the present constitution is a, an anti-Marcos or a post-Marcos constitution. Now they have a chance to create a new legal order uh, that would be more respectful of their uh, aspirational ideal. Uh, what do you think about that? Um, I think if a new constitution would be presented to a plebiscite today, Cordelia would vote it, <laughs> would vote for it uh, overwhelmingly under the current administration uh, for whatever reason that they may have, but because um, of that political leaning or belief that um, Marcos can do no wrong. I know this is controversial, especially among uh, Cordillera lawyers that I work with, that I uh, have these vigorous discussions with, but it's a reality that we have to face and study why Cordillera o o is staunchly pro-Marcos. So a new constitution, whether it's a piecemeal amendment or uh, mm -hmm. an entirely new one, would pass um, easily in this area. But if I may say something, John, um, what I believe, to answer the same question that you asked, um, Sir Oliver, uh, what I like about the Supreme Court in the last 30 years is that there is greater um, recognition of women's rights, children's rights, um, indigenous people's rights, many of those collective rights that were uh, first found uh, in the, and written in the 1987 Constitution. So in those uh, aspects, the Supreme Court has been a really progressive and activist one. But the record of the Philippine Supreme Court in the last 30 years, insofar as contests involving exercise of presidential powers, mm -hmm. has been spotty mm -hmm. um, at the most. <laughs> uh, but in fact, it's 100, almost 100% on the side of the executive, especially during the Duterte's time. Um, so, and I think it goes into the very composition of the Supreme Court. Um, but the um, important thing for us who are activists in, uh, in civil, and who operate in civil society groups is that there is greater acknowledgement that there are newer and newer rights that need to be brought to the fore and by way of reinterpreting certain provisions of the Constitution. Thank you. And Attorney Chrissy, uh, you're accredited with the International Criminal Court. Uh, and of course, uh, the Duterte family is uh, waiting uh, for, uh, uh, for something to happen. Um, they are on the other side. But as far as constitutional change is concerned, in 2024, they are now very uh, much against it, right? How, how should we navigate this particular uh, terrain now uh, where the Dutertes are among the most vocal uh, against uh, charter change? How do we make sense of this? Uh, this just drives home the point that uh, charter change is for whom? For the politicians in power. And I think they're taking this position squarely against the Marcoses. Mm -hmm. Um, they're thi I'm thinking that they are building up these blocks in Congress, mm -hmm. um, one for charter change for the Marcoses and the other against charter change for the Dutertes. Mm -hmm. And they want to make this distinction clear. But unfortunately, what I mean in terms of, of substance, it's just different and they have different reasons. I mean, the, if you ask the congressman, why are you supporting this provision? Mm -hmm. I would most likely say that they will say, uh, well, because I'm part of the Marcus block, I'm part of the uh, minority or the majority. So, mm -hmm. um, the the technically the uh, 1987 Constitution is uh, just tangential to the Rome Statute or to any provision with regards to to the war on drugs, mm -hmm. except that it is under the 1987 Constitution that we have a case 
um, asking for um, the constitutionality of the war on drugs case. Okay. But that's a separate thing altogether from the investigation of the ICC. Mm -hmm. And the ICC at present um, is trying to pin down possible um, perpetrators of crimes against humanity in the Philippines, mm -hmm. quote unquote, the most responsible. Mm -hmm. And if the Marcoses figure out there, um, they say that there would be revolution, there would be chaos. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that there is basis for that mm -hmm. unless they stir up the chaos. On that very cheerful note, <laughs> uh, this has been a very enlightening, even provocative discussion. Thank you, uh, Attorney Lulu G. Reyes of St. Louis University in Baguio. Uh, Attorney Oliver Xavier Reyes, uh, UP College of Law. Uh, and Attorney uh, Chrissy uh, Conti of the NUPL. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for us tonight. The next step for engaged citizens, as always, is to take a more active part in rebuilding our democracy. See you in the public square. This is John Neri. Thank you and good night. Thank you.